Trader's Corner is brought to you by IG. Welcome to Trader's Corner. As always, I'm joined by Garth McKenzie, founder and editor of Trader's Corner. Garth, welcome. Hi, Julieta. Garth, um, it's a bit repetitive for us to say it's tricky out there in the market, but it's tricky. And I know that you're feeling rather frustrated. So we're going to look at uh, somewhat more of an educational bent uh, this evening. Yeah. But uh, perhaps to start off with, your thoughts of the top 40 at the moment? Yeah, it's, it's very much a case of when in doubt, stay out at the moment because the market's got, there's just no follow through either side. When it, you know, upside breakouts seem to be failing, downside breakouts seem to be failing. It's just, it's a real mess out there. And it's very difficult to try and navigate in that kind of environment. Yeah. And, and f uh, what I've been saying to my clients is that, you know, capital preservation really is key at a time like this. Um, you don't have to be forcing any trades if there's nothing to do, don't worry. You can just sit on your hands, wait. The opportunities will come. And the market's not going to stay range-bound and tight like this forever. At some point, it's going to find a direction, whether it's up mm -hmm. or down. And then we'll be able to probably pick out some trades. But while it's chopping around sideways and not really going anywhere, it's very, very difficult. Yeah. So, I mean, we have experienced this before. Uh, at what, I think 2011, if yeah, I recall, yeah. much of the year was actually just sideways frustration. 2011 was the, the most difficult year um, in my career that I can remember because the market literally did just go sideways for a very, very long period of time. And then in August of that year, um, the whole Greece debacle happened and the market got a big hiding and, and it dropped off sharply. But other than that, other than the Greece thing and the market really just tracked along sideways. And that was a very, very difficult year um, personally for trading. And I remember on this show, we also, I think it was probably our worst performing year for the Traders Corner TV show. Mm. Um, so it was difficult. And, and so far right now, what we've got is a difficult environment yeah. as well. Okay, well, let's um, have a look at the chart of the S&P 500 just to illustrate that. Point. Yeah, so first up, I've got the S&P 500 just to look at the bigger picture, and then we'll take it on to the top 40 after this. Um, what, what is just quite interesting to point out is that, have a look on this chart where my mouse cursor is there. That's the middle of March. And you can see the index is at the same level now as it was in the middle of March. So basically for two and a half months nearly, um, this S&P 500 has gone mm. absolutely nowhere. And, and within that time, I mean, it's had a little bit of a move up and a little bit of a move down, but that's really 50 points up and 50 points down on the S&P 500, that's 2.5%. Uh, so it's really been in a relatively tight range for the last 2.5 months. It's difficult to trade that. And then, of course, we've got this head and shoulders that I know I've been going on about recently, and not only me, other commentators have also picked it out mm -hmm. and said, oh, well, there's a perfect textbook head and shoulders pattern, and it's likely to break to the downside. And there were all kinds of reasons why we thought it probably could break to the downside. Um, it actually did make an effort to break to the downside last week. And uh, we traded down as low as about 2025. And then it reversed all the way back. And that particular afternoon, it then closed on the high of the session. So effectively, a reversal back up above the neckline of that head and shoulders pattern. So it kind of negated the break to the downside. Mm -hmm. And now you always sort of look at a situation like this, and it begs the question, well, if what is such an obviously bearish uh, topping pattern doesn't follow through to the downside, does that then mean that we're going to probably break to the upside? It's possible. Uh, sometimes a failed head and shoulders pattern can be deemed bullish, mm -hmm. and it can pop to the upside. But it's difficult to say. I mean, right now, if I look at that, um, the one thing that does sort of stand out for me is that we've got a little bit of positive divergence here on the stochastic. That's where your stochastic's making a, 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 low, a higher low, while the price has made a, um, a lower low. So that that potentially is it, it could maybe point to a move to the upside. But as I say. For two months, we've gone nowhere. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, as much as we couldn't trust the break to the downside, well, I don't know if we can trust the break to the upside either. Quite honestly, <laughs> it's an environment to sit on your hands, like I said, because anything you do right, really at the moment is a bit of a 50-50. Yeah. And in this business, we prefer trades that are better than 50-50 odds. Yeah. And the top 40, Garth? Well, here's the top 40 spot index now. So this is the J200. Um, and what's noticeable here is that this top 40 also is pretty range bound. Since uh, beginning of March, it's been tracking this range really between 47,000 and 45,000. Now we're up approaching this 45, uh, this 47,000 area rather on the top 40 index. And it'll be interesting to see what happens when it gets to that resistance, whether it stops there and turns lower or whether it manages to break to the upside. 
which of course for you is key because uh, you have June futures close out and this is when your option structure expires. Yeah. Um, yeah. So talk us through the danger points for that. Yeah. Well, I'll show you an hourly chart um, now of the top 40 future, which is what we're monitoring okay. here. I just quickly want to highlight here those two little yellow blocks that I've put onto the screen there. Um, the, the one on the right here highlights the sideways action that we've seen for the last seven trading days where this top 40 spot index has really been trading in about a 700 point range. Okay. Uh, and it's very tight range and up and down, no particular follow through and it's quite frustrating. The last time we saw something like that was back in November last year. Um, that's highlighted on the little yellow box to the left over there. And that time we saw the market uh, tracking sideways for 11 days in a row, also in a 700 point trading range. So, you know, we're not going to stay in this tight range forever. We are going to break out of it one way or the other quite soon. Um, but whilst we're stuck in that range, it's a bit difficult to make any firm calls on which way we're going. Here's the, uh, the hourly chart of the top 40 futures index now. And this is what we need to monitor in terms of the option structure that I've got on. Last week, we talked a little bit about this option structure that runs out until the June futures close out. So that runs until the 15th of June, I think, is the close out. And... The, the, the risk with this is that we are net written on 47,000 strike calls. So the if the market goes up, because I'm short those, I'm written on 47,000 calls, it means as the market goes up, I start to lose money mm. if the market breaks above 47,000, and that's a problem for me. And you can see that this range on the top 40 futures between 46,300 at the bottom and 47,150 at the top. And of course, it's flirted with this 47,000 area a number of times, well, four, four or five times in the last seven trading days, effectively. And of course, that doesn't make for um, an easy, easy, sleeping. easy he sleeping and easy hedging of, a, of an mm. option structure. So, you know, if we start to break out convincingly to the top of this sideways channel, I think I'm going to probably need to look to buy the top 40 future or top 40 CFD in order to create some kind of a hedge there. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we'll talk about that maybe on next week's show. But for now, it's just it's, it's, it's making life a little bit tricky in terms of managing the hedge around that option yeah. structure. Okay. Well, what we are going to talk about this evening are capital raisings and book builds. Mm -hmm. um, and because we've had quite a few of them, and sometimes they can be pretty positive, and sometimes they can be disastrous. Yeah. Witness PPC yesterday. Yes. So yeah. um, this is the educational aspect of the show. So talk us through why it is um, that for a, for a trader they're interesting. Yeah, I mean, if we're not going to put on any specific trades, we might as well talk about something interesting and something educational, and as you say, something that's quite topical at the moment. Um, PPC is the most topical capital raise uh, that we've got happening in our market at the moment. And really, just to talk about the two types, effectively you've got uh, uh, capital raising and book builds, and sometimes they do overlap with each other. So... A capital raise is where companies, as it says on the screen there, companies raise fresh equity capital by selling new shares when they need additional capital for business expansion or alternatively to fund ongoing business activities. Um, and it's effectively when they come to the market and issue new shares mm. um, in order to raise the, the number of shares in issue for that company, bring new cash into the business effectively to then fund things. And it depends on what the reason is for, the, for a company doing a capital raise. And I've seen different types. You, you get capital raises where it's in order to fund growth, and there's some fancy growth avenue being exploited or an acquisition or something, and often that is quite positive. And then you get, like we've seen with PPC this week, where you get a capital raise which, you know, for all intents and purposes is really actually to try and just keep this company going. Mm. Um, it's not really great news and they, they're looking to raise up to four billion rand in a, in a capital raise which is half which, of their market cap. exactly it's half of their market capitalization and, uh, and and really I mean that's a lot of money to raise for a company to, to, in, to increase their uh, market cap by, by half effectively and you can see now as that announcement gets made and this was yesterday look at that huge big gap to the downside on on PPC's share price over there the st the share price dropped by 15% yesterday mm -hmm. and the likelihood is that this price will probably remain relatively depressed now for a while i don't see it rallying up and filling that gap anytime soon because this is going to be very dilutionary effectively they issue a whole lot of new shares so the greater number of shares in issue and therefore the, the price of the whole, the whole company comes down in terms of the share price. But Garth, aren't capital raisings always dilutionary? And it's just um, whether you accept being diluted because it's a bad thing or a good thing, because yeah. if it's for a, for a growth strategy, 
you don't mind being diluted. Yeah, exactly right. If there's growth happening and, uh, and, and, and there's good news and good reason for the capital raise happening, then yes, uh, then sometimes you don't mind being diluted because effectively what you're doing is you're, you're cutting the pie up into smaller pieces, but you're making the pie bigger mm. in, in, a sen in a sense in terms of the company's market capitalization. This one that we've seen on PPC here is not a great example in terms of whether you would want to be um, you know, bullish on a, on a capital raise like this. But we've got some other examples here as well. And then also I want to talk about um, book builds as a, as a capital raising exercise. You know, that, that PPC one would be, uh, with the details still need to be announced, but likely that's new shares that'll be issued. Um, a book build slash capital raising is when a company wishes to raise fresh equity capital by selling new shares into the market uh, to new or existing shareholders in an accelerated book build. It can be followed. Now, a company that does this quite well and has done it quite often is PSG Group. Um, Yanni Moton and the, uh, the guys from Stellenbosch have been very successful in raising capital at good times. And this is what they did on, PPC, uh, on PSG rather, uh, at the end of last year. It was on the 3rd of December, if my memory serves me correctly. And uh, they came to the market. At that stage, uh, you can see that the PSG share price was trading at around about 270 Rand a share. And if you did a sum of the parts calculation at that point in time and you added up all the uh, Capitec, Zeda, PSG Consult, and all the other businesses that make up the uh, PSG group, this PSG group share was trading at a wild premium to mm. its sum of the parts, which was a very strange thing to see for a, a, an investment holding company. It's usually you actually find these companies trade at a discount to the sum of the parts valuation. So it was hugely uh, overinflated. And obviously... Um, the, the PSG management thought, well, what a great opportunity to sell new shares into the market, issue new stock, and we'll just you know, rake in a couple of billion rand of new capital to fund future growth. I mean, the question is why everyone said, yeah, let's give them their money. It's so <laughs> overvalued. Yeah, I'll, <laughs> give me some of those PSGs. I know. It's, it's bizarre. And when you look at it now and you see the share price trading back down at around 180 rand, I mean, all of those new shares that were taken up in this book build were, uh, they're all underwater, a long way underwater. Mm. But obviously the investors saw uh, the long-term potential of the company to continue to create growth. Um, what they were looking for here was to do one, to raise one and a half billion rand in, uh, in, in fresh capital. It was done via an accelerated book build. Now, what that means is that the company will go to a bunch of investment banks and say, right, guys, we need to raise one and a half billion rand of new equity capital here. You've got clients that are pension funds and hedge funds and what, whatever. Go and sell the stock to your clients effectively. Typically, a book build will always be done at a discount to the prevailing share price because you need to do it at a discount in order to make it enticing for yep. new investors to come and take up that stock. So this, this particular book build was uh, placed at 245 Rand per share at a time when the shares were trading in the market at 270 Rand a share. So a nice discount. And as I said, they wanted one and a half billion Rand. They ended up receiving bids for 3.9 billion Rands of of, worth of stock. So they thought, well, you know what, let's increase the, the, the stakes a little bit. Let's take 2.2 billion rands worth of new investors. And, uh, and, and, and the, that deal was done. And that's an example of a book build. Mm. And what about Barclays Africa? Because I know you also want to have a look at that. Yeah, so this is a different type of a book build where, it, now remember with PSG, we were talking about the company issuing new shares to effectively raise new capital for the company. Now, in the case of Barclays, which we're going to look at now, this is an, a book build whereby existing, an existing shareholder looks to exit a stake. Um, so it's when a large shareholder wishes to sell a large block of stock that would typically be too large to sell through the open market, and then an accelerated book, book build happens to place that stock. And what we've seen with Barclays Africa recently, we know that Barclays Group PLC have indicated that they're wanting to exit their stake of Barclays Africa, and they own um, more than 62% of the total uh, Barclays Africa Group. Now, what we saw recently at the beginning of May was uh, Barclays PLC announced an accelerated book build to sell 12.2% of the issued share capitals of the Barclay, Af Barclays Africa Group. And again, this was placed at a discount. This, these shares uh, were sold out at 126 Rand per share at a time when the, market, the prevailing market price had been about 145 Rand per share. So again, it needs to be done at a discount in order to entice new investors to mm -hmm. come in and take that stock off the hands of the existing yeah. shareholder. But it is existing stock, not new stock. That's the difference. Yeah, that's the difference. And, and, and you'll see this from time to time when you've got one very large shareholder that wishes to sell down a stake. 
uh, then they will do it via an accelerated book build. I mean, it is a very interesting subject, and unfortunately, I haven't actually left enough time to talk about it, but Garth, we have to wrap up there, and just a quick look at where the portfolio stands, unchanged from last week. Yeah, it's exactly the same as last week, 278,000 Rand in the account, so we're up 11% for the year to date, and no new positions. All, all I'm doing right now is monitoring that option structure, which runs out until the middle of June. Okay, Garth, thanks very much, as always, for joining us. Garth McKenzie is founder and editor of Traders Corner. Trader's Corner is brought to you by IG.